Welcome to the bonus show, everybody. Um, there's an interesting new poll out that finds that Americans have a mutual mistrust of the other side and are also open to exploring alternatives to democracy. And a share of Republicans and Democrats believe it is acceptable to use violence to stop the opposite party from achieving its goals. So let's go through the numbers. A majority of voters that support Trump or Biden believe that electing people from the other party would result in lasting harm to the United States. So Biden supporters believe that electing Republicans would harm the United States. Trump supporters believe that electing Democrats would uh, harm the United States. OK, 52 percent of Biden supporters say Republican voters are a threat to American life. 47% of Trump supporters believe that Democrats are a threat to American life. All right, roughly even numbers. We continue. 41% of Biden supporters believe that what Republicans want is so extreme that it would be acceptable to use violence to stop them. And almost identical numbers 38% of Trump supporters say what Democrats want is so extreme that it would be acceptable to use violence to stop Democrats from achieving their goals. So about 40 percent. What do you think, Pat? Basically, 40 percent of both parties voters believe it would be acceptable to use violence to stop the damaging goals and agenda of the other side. Yeah, that is quite high. That is a lot higher than I expected. The first two poll questions were pretty much in line with what I thought the numbers would be. Because if I was asked this question, do I believe that Republican voters are a threat to American life? I would say yes. And I think that the Republican Party is uh, setting out to do harm against the country. So I would also say yes to that one. But when it comes to violence, justifying violence in such a way, I'm surprised that 38 percent of Trump supporters and 41 percent of Biden supporters say that that would be acceptable. I suppose you can craft some sort of doomsday scenario where you can get me to agree to that position where Trump supporters are the ones causing the violence and Biden supporters are the ones responding to the violence. And maybe in that sort of scenario, I would say, yes, it's acceptable. But mm. only short of that, I just think that we should maintain the position that violence isn't acceptable, that you should fight the other side at the ballot box and legislatively and, you know, keep the weapons and the, and the fist fights and all that stuff at home. Yeah, I mean, that's always my tendency. And the the biggest argument I hear against the no violence perspective that many of us have is sometimes if you have violence being done against you by a system, the only way to stop it is to do violence yourself. And then we get into a debate over, well, what counts as violence? And it's not necessarily punching someone, but you might have a system that is implicitly violent in the sense that it discriminates against certain people. And so because that's a form of violence, then violence. I, I just I really have trouble with those arguments. Like I get them theoretically, but I just really struggle to think that that's the that's the point where we're at. And it depends so much on the particulars. And there are plenty of people who say that even if the other side is committing violence against you, that doesn't mean that you should respond in kind with violence, either through some sort of moral stance that they have or yeah. because people may argue that it's not the best way to go about achieving things with the civil rights movement being the prime example, yep. of course, supporting nonviolent retaliation. And of course, that was successful when you take a look at that movement. But then there's other movements around the world where that maybe that would not have worked. Uh, you take a look at the struggle in South Africa, for example. So I'm interested to see these polling numbers. It makes me concerned about the future of the country that so many yes. people seem to be ready to put up arms against the other side. It's also another thing to say that you're willing to commit violence and to actually do it. To actually do it would be taking a far greater step. Uh, but I'm not too happy seeing these poll numbers myself. No, I agree with you. And that is an interesting follow up question, which is, OK, these are the percentages that would be in agreement with the use of violence to stop the political opponents. What percentage of the respondents would be willing to engage in the violence themselves? I am sure it would be smaller than the number who approve. But the question is, how much smaller is it? Three percent of the country that's willing to actually do the violence? Is it 
10 percent? Is it 20? I don't know what the answer is to that. And of course, it depends on what the repercussions are. If this is some sort of doomsday scenario where there's not going to be any consequences for your actions, maybe right. people will be more willing to commit violence than otherwise if they actually do have to be held accountable for it. And then there's this other uh, polling question from this um, survey asking people whether they believe democracy is still a viable form of government. 31% of Trump supporters say that they are open towards looking to other forms of government. I'm surprised yeah. it's not higher, given that Trump did try to overthrow <laughs> yeah. the last election results. Where Had they done that, it would have now been a different form of government where the winner doesn't actually get to govern. Yeah. And they may not realize that it would be a different form of government. But yes, it would be only 24% of Biden supporters say that that would actually be acceptable. But here it seems like we're conflating democracy with the system of government that we have here in the United States, which allows the person who gets fewer votes to win the presidency, for example. But I guess that's a whole different conversation. Right. I mean, in a sense, the Electoral College is not really it's not a direct democracy, that's nope. for sure. But all right. Well, those are the poll numbers, disturbing, certainly to some degree. Hey, here's a really interesting new use of AI. Um, there has been a AI used to read an inscrutable ancient scroll for the first time. There are these scrolls that they just look like coal. When you see pictures of this, these are the Herculaneum scrolls. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly or Herculaneum, which survived the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in year 79. And if you try to unroll them, it's actually a scroll, even though it looks like a piece of coal. If you try to unroll it, uh, it's believed that they would crumble. And these are pieces that seem unreadable to the human eye. But now these have been decoded using computer technology. And the word in Greek for purple was found on one of these scrolls. It's crazy to call them scrolls because they, they really look like rocks. It's crazy. Um, and uh, the idea here is to use a technique known as virtual wrapping to decipher what is on there. And it starts with a computer tomography, which is sort of like an X-ray of the wrapped up papyrus. And then you virtually flatten them and then you use AI to find where is their ink and then to start deciphering what is there. These are just um, wrapped up petri essentially petrified scrolls that were found in volcanic mud. And we've identified so far the word purple on there, which doesn't tell us a ton, Pat, but this is a fascinating use of AI tech. Yeah, it is really cool. And I think it goes to show that many of the uses that we're going to have for AI, we have a difficult time foreseeing. Like when AI was getting developed over the years, I don't think anyone thought a specific use would be to be able to decipher these ancient texts. Uh, from from ruins that people couldn't do themselves because you'd be ruining the the rock that you have. Yeah. And in a similar sense, there's going to be plenty of other uses for AI that we can't foresee right now. We're already starting to think about medical diagnoses. We're yep. thinking about translation for languages. We're thinking about you know generating you know video content and art and music compositions and all of these cool things. But there's going to be plenty of other things that will come down the pike that we're not even aware now that AI is going to have the capability of being able to do. And so that is exciting, but also it, it can make you concerned because if you think, OK, well, if the AI gets access to the nuclear codes, what if it tries to become smarter than us, then we may have a real problem on our hands. I am super interested in the ways that AI could be used. You know, medicine has already started to go in the direction of it being customized to the individual specifics about the individual. This happens with cancer treatment and in some other areas. We're really looking at the individual makeup of a person or of a tumor or whatever the case may be and tailoring treatment using genetic factors. The ways some of the most interesting things I'm seeing and none of this diminishes the concerns about AI, but some of the most interesting things I'm seeing is the ability of putting through huge amounts of data about the genetics of individuals, the treatments they received and the treatment outcomes to synthesize that data and then be able to apply it to say, hey, by by looking at the genetics of an individual based on everybody who's received treatment so far and their genetics and their outcomes, here is the best possible tailored treatment for this particular person. We're talking about computer processing power to maybe dramatically improve health outcomes. Yeah, it's really cool. And if you had a human doing that sort of thing, it would take them 
a long time and it would yeah. be hugely costly because not everyone can do that sort of work, right? It's a high skilled position. So obviously you're going to have to pay that person a whole bunch of money. But if AI can do it in a short amount of time, then that's going to be a money saver and a time saver. I do worry about the possibility of mistakes though. Of course, humans can make mistakes as well, but you know, playing around with the AI platforms that I use like ChatGPT, for example, Sometimes they'll hallucinate. Sometimes you can't get it to get back on the right path and it just makes up things. So I'd be worried about that when we think about like medical applications and things that are more serious. But yep. I suppose if you have a human being behind it all, checking every step of the way that everything is going well, then it should all be fine. And with a lot of these things, it's not about, you know, some of the hallucinations from chat GPT are about you know, saying events took place that didn't take place or something like that. Presumably with some of these medical applications, you're really restricting. It's an interpretation of data and data that you are providing. And so obviously there still need to be controls and checks and balances and the, and the like. But um, at least in theory, we should be able to prevent hallucinations in that way. Yeah. And, it, and I'm, I'm guessing that they're not using chat GPT. I would be pretty, yeah. uh, pretty concerned if they were trying to come up with a medical diagnosis for me and it was chat GPT four that I saw on the computer screen. Uh, agreed. Agreed. <laughs> hey, let's talk about Lauren Boebert a little bit. We we've we've said before Lauren Boebert has a Democratic challenger. The elections in November of 2024. His name's Adam Frisch. He almost defeated her in 2022. This is a great person to support in 2024. But before even getting to that point, Lauren Boebert has other problems. And the problem now is that there are some major Republican donors backing a different Republican in the primary in the third congressional district of Colorado. There are at least 10 former Boebert donors who funneled nearly 13 K into her campaign in 2020, who are now donating to Jeff Hurd, who's a Republican primarying Lauren Boebert. This is a relatively small number of donors that are bailing, but they are relatively significant donors who have put in a bunch of money into Hurd's campaign. Now, this is not about at this point in time. It's definite that Lauren Boebert is going to lose the primary. It still looks like she'll probably win. But the point is, if this early in the game, there are already people donating to her opponent and she's having public problems as a result of you know, the public sex acts, the Beetlejuice fiasco, et cetera. And she only lost by about 500 votes to Adam Frisch last time around anyway. The totality of the picture is not looking that great for Lauren Boebert right now, which is exciting because it would be delightful to remove her. Yeah. And a primary challenger means that Boebert's going to have to spend a significant amount of money on the primary itself, which means that she'll have less money to fund for the general. Yep. And when we look at Adam Frisch's fundraising totals, he's beaten uh, Boebert by a factor of four in the last quarter, uh, bringing in nearly thirty four million dollars. Yep. So she's already at this tremendous disadvantage. It's another disadvantage to have to fight a primary. So the longer this goes on, the more data that we're seeing. I don't think that Lauren Boebert has that much time remaining in Congress. I don't think that no. she's going to end up winning reelection. Ultimately, it's going to come down to who cast their votes on Election Day. But I think many people who stayed at home, many Democrats realize if this really is within our grasp, if we only lost it last time by a few hundred votes, we can pick up this seat. And Lauren Boebert is such a, an embarrassment, I'm sure, to this district, to this area of Colorado, that it's going to be something that people are really engaged in and they're going to go to the polls to kick her out of office. We had this sort of like a hydra, this three headed monster of MAGA Trumpism in Congress, Marjorie Trader Greene, Madison Cawthorn and Lauren Boebert. Madison Cawthorn lost his primary last time around and wasn't even on the final ballot. So that was one out of three. Lauren Boebert saved herself, but only by about the 500 votes that I mentioned. And Marjorie Ta Taylor Greene easily won, easily won. So the hope would be that Lauren Boebert is next to go. And then we start working on Marjorie Taylor Greene, I guess. Yep. Yep. She's the last one. But I suppose there's going to be a new crop of Trump supporting far right Congress people who come in and take their place. That's the concern anyway. And there are yeah. some people you can put on that short list, like, for example, Matt Gates, Byron Donalds. But I think the big three that came into power a couple of years ago, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert and Madison Cawthorn, they were above and beyond because they were not only crazy, they were especially unqualified and seemingly bad at their job, just bad at the politics as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've we've taken down one. Maybe we can take down the second one. 
this uh, election cycle. And then Marjorie Taylor Greene seems to be in a pretty safe district. So it may be a while before we take could be a down. while. But yeah, eventually I am holding out hope that we can. Well, eventually she'll leave eventually. Congress. The question is, what will be the circumstances? Yeah. Hey, quick programming note. Uh, I am going to make an attempt to do a live stream tonight. And even with two copyright strikes, the reason I'm going to do it is Joe Biden is making a national address to the nation. Those are public domain. They are broadcast by everybody from C-SPAN through whomever. So I believe, Pat, that it is a very safe live stream to do with really no risk of a third copyright strike. Hopefully those are not famous last words, but Biden is speaking tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern and I'm going to be going live at 715 Eastern. Hopefully people will join me. Yes, of course. We'll just have to make sure that we use a feed of C-SPAN, for example, yeah. as opposed to a Fox News feed. That probably wouldn't be the smartest move. And uh, also, we have to make sure that we don't copyright ourselves, copyright strike ourselves, because this is our own copyright material that we're going to be putting out there. So yeah. we potentially could have a claim to take it down if we so choose. But as long as we don't bring up that claim, we should be good. Man, does anybody know what Pat's talking about? It's getting really crazy on the bonus show today. Yeah, no, but in all seriousness, I'm actually interested in what Joe Biden will say. The topic is going to be the Hamas Israel war um, and uh, Joe Biden making some major accomplishments in the in the last 24 hours with regard to funding for Palestinians, a deal for funding for Ukraine, Israel and the border, uh, getting is, is uh, Egypt to um, uh, funnel in aid to God. I mean, just serious accomplishments. My guess is to some degree this is going to be Biden gloating, not glo I don't say gloating negatively, but announcing his accomplishments in order to get credit for them. And I'm curious what else he will say. Yeah, that that's definitely worthy of covering for a stream. I wonder if Trump will do an event to counter it, as he so often likes to do. Right. But having him speak about such a serious topic right now, maybe not it may not be in the best form, I think, uh, because he's only going to put his foot in his mouth and maybe make the matter worse. Yeah, nothing on Trump's calendar right now. His next scheduled event is Monday. Uh, but stranger things have happened. So we will certainly see maybe Trump will put out a troth or even an excretion, which would really be exciting, I, I think, to many people in the audience. Uh, we'll follow it. I hope to see you live at 715 and uh, we'll be back tomorrow. See you then.